1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to go back to verse 11. I know we kind of covered this last week, but I, I want to include that <clears throat> in what we're going to study this week. So starting in verse 11 of chapter 2. As you know how we exhorted and encouraged and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak of the Gentile, to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Last week, whenever we started the class, we talked about leaders, and we talked about what, you know, kind of the characteristics of leaders. And if you look at Paul, he is the one that started the church at Thessalonica. And if you remember, we talked about whenever he came to Thessalonica, he was there for three weeks, he was run out of town, he had been run out of town whenever he came to Thessalonica from Philippi. And before that, he had been stoned and they thought he was dead, so they left him outside the city, but they didn't kill him. He don't give up. He keeps going on regardless of whatever. Now, if you read this, Paul is not asking hey, I started the church, so you need to finance my missionary journey. You need to send me money. You need to send me food. If I was to ask you, what was Paul's reward in this? What did he look at as being his reward? Grace of God. Grace of God. Souls being saved. Yeah. Souls being saved. And if you look at that, whenever we, we looked at verse 11 and 12, and then at the very end of the chapter, he is tickled to death that God is working in these people's lives. That is what he considers good. He even says in verse 17, he says, but we brethren, and, and we're going to go back and forth today, so... But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. That word desire there means lust. He had such a desire to see these people and to see how they're doing and to make sure that they are following Jesus. That was his crown. He didn't want money from them. He didn't want food from them. He didn't want anything else from them. He just wanted to know they're following Jesus. That was his heart's desire. Do we have leaders like that today? Yes. Hmm? yes. We do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I've got a quotation up here that says a leader is not 
Now last week we kind of talked about what a leader was and the characteristics of a leader. But today I want us to look at first, a leader is not what? If you were to think of a pastor, a teacher, um, whatever, a leader, what should they not be? Wrapped up in themselves. Wrapped up in themselves, okay. So we're talking about good leaders because, you know, some leaders are, but they well, should not be. I just said a leader. I did not say a good leader or a bad leader. <laughs> So that, that kind of leaves it wide open there. So whenever you think about a leader, what are they not? What should they not be? Passive. What? Passive. Passive? Okay, I can talk about that this week. Man, we need to get back to the other class. Y'all are really <laughs> quiet in here. Inconsistent. Inconsistent? So in other words, and, and I understand kind of what you think, because I think of an administrator, I want my administrator to be consistent with his dealings with me and the students every day. You know, I don't want him to be, okay, you can do this today, but tomorrow, no, you can't do that. I understand that. Anybody else? Miriam? Get myself in trouble here. <laughs> but one thing that does concern me is, oh goodness, I don't know if I should say this. I think there's too many women in leadership. Okay. I'm thinking of the governors. I don't, it's troublesome. Okay. And I'm not against women. Yeah, I understand I, what you mean. But as, as biblically, I'm thinking mm -hmm. there's the men. Yeah, whenever you look at qualifications for a pastor and for a deacon, right? You know, you you got that. Do what I say, not what I do, or how to put it. You know. Probably. Yeah. In other words, you will do this, but don't do like I do. Right. You know. Lead by example. Lead by example. Right. For me, it's somebody who doesn't uh, seek his own advantage. Well-being, but it's looking at the, the well-being, like a good shepherd, looking for the sheep. Okay, a leader is not looking out for themselves. Yeah, I like that. A leader's not power hungry. Not power hungry. It's not a complainer. Not a complainer. Have you ever seen a leader or something goes wrong and they blame it on the workers? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not my fault. If Robert had done what I told him to do, we wouldn't have this issue. One of the things I thought about is a leader is not jealous. A leader is not jealous. If things are going good, a leader should be pleased that the workers are going well. And a leader should not, well, so-and-so is getting more credit than I am. So I'm going to have to do something about that. Well, you see, Paul is not any of those. Paul has a heart for the people and for them to do what God wants them to do. Jim, you got something? Well, you talk about a leader. I a classic example last night when I was watching football. At the halftime, the coach took the reason. I made the mistake. It was my fault. I made that decision. He didn't blame anybody else. Yeah. And he didn't play the blame game. Yeah. And you see that a lot of times with leaders. It's not my fault. If he hadn't have dropped the pass, he had not Yeah, I understand what you mean. Good point. But Paul, man, he, he just, the only thing he wants, verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God. That you would walk worthy of God. scripture that I think of is uh, uh, pick up your cross and follow Christ. Yeah. And that's one of the things we get to in just a minute. So that, no, you're great. That's fine because that is 
what we're supposed to do. Paul is not saying, it's my gospel, it, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's always God. Because in verse 13, he writes, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He mentions the Word of God twice in that verse. How is God's Word different than man's Word? It's true. Number one, it's true. It's powerful. It doesn't change. Do what? It doesn't change. Oh, oh, God's Word, yeah. God's Word doesn't change. I was actually talking with somebody about that yesterday. <laughs> You know, God doesn't change His mind just because society changes. How many of you are astonished at the changes in morality in the United States since you were a child? Remember the Lucille Ball show? Her and Daisy were married, but they slept in separate beds. You know, they just didn't do anything like that. It's changed. And that was on television. Yeah. So, God's Word does not change just simply because society changes. We take it as truth. It is powerful. Do people, and the reason I'm talking about all this, because it goes back to leadership in churches. It goes back to leadership in churches. How many churches do you believe follow the pastor and not God? I mean, you do see that a lot. Do people? One of the things I well, one of the things I try to encourage y'all to do, and I know, you know, Roger and everybody else does the same way. Go home and read the Bible for yourself. You know, read it for yourself. See what God is saying to you. Don't listen to somebody up there on the pulpit without you honestly checking them out. Would you know if Roger told you a falsehood? Would you know if I told you a falsehood? You should be able to tell. You should be able to tell. So he mentions the Word of God. He said, it is the truth. And he said, it effectually worketh also in you that believe. Got a quotation up here. We're never too old to learn. Now, I know this is a young class, and some of y'all may not be able to relate to what old people go through. But we're never too old to learn. We're never too old to serve. <laughs> uh, but we're never, never, never to. If we shut the Bible so I've learned all I can, and man, that's it. See, that this word up here, worketh, that means he's continuing to work in your life, even at our age today. How many of you have a uh, different view of some scripture? now than you did when you were in your 20s and 30s. Yeah, yeah and you go, oh, that's what that means now. I get it now. We're still learning. He is still working in us. If you are not different today than you were 20 years ago, then you need to question something. If you're not different than you were 20 years ago, you need to question something. You should have been continuing to grow. God is continually working on us. Y'all know the little kid song? He's still working on me, making me what ought to be. And y'all, please stay, okay? Don't, don't run out. 
But you know, we can sing that as adults. He's still working on me. Isn't, it, isn't that the truth? Rachel said, thank God. <laughs> you know. I'm going to tell this story. And it wasn't me. And this is not a discussion on whether you should wear a mask or not. I had a guy tell me that he was in a, a store. And then somebody passed him and said, Hey, put your mask on. And then he used an acronym at the end of put your mask on. You're going to have to figure that one out. But anyway, he, he called him a name. And I was thinking, if that had been that guy 20 years ago, he'd have probably decked him. Mm. Yep. You know, you ain't talking about me or my mama like that. <laughs> but they said he, he said he just walked on. To me, that is a thing of God still working on people. He's still working. There's things that 20 years ago would have just got on my nerves big time. And I don't think it's just the older I get, I don't think it's just age. I think it's I'm, I'm allowing God to work more in my life than He did then. Because there's some things that I would have just flown off the handle about. He's still working. And that's what Paul is telling the Thessalonians. Got to remember, this is a young church. Very young church. So he is still trying to tell them the Word of God is still working. Do you ever get to a point where you wonder if God is aware of what's going on? God, are you, are, are, <laughs> you know what's going on in the United States today? God, why don't you take some of these people out of power? God, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? What does God tell us to do for the leaders? Pray for them. How many of us pray for them, Lord? Get them. <laughs> Get them. You know, it's almost like we're seeking God on these leaders. Well, how do we pray for leaders that we don't like? It's easy to pray for them that we like and we agree with. <clears throat> what do we do whenever we got people we don't agree with? God's still working on us. And that's what He's telling the people in, in, in Thessalonica. Then in verse 14, He says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things as your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. That word followers up there literally means imitators. Imitators. It was mentioned a few minutes ago. We are to be followers of Christ. We are to imitate Jesus. In what ways? Yeah, all of our ways. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Or it should be. You know, do we imitate him in all of our lives? <laughs> yeah, there's sometimes I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, please forgive me. You know, whenever somebody cuts you off in traffic, you always throw them a peace sign, don't you? <laughs> peace out, bro. <laughs> yeah. Or do we, you idiot? You want me to? We're to, be, we're to imitate Jesus. And he's saying you need to imitate the churches of God from Judea. Can we pick up good things from other churches? Sure. Yes. Yeah, hopefully we do. I used to be a thief whenever I was teaching because if another teacher had something that was kind of working in their class and I thought I could use in my class, I took it. I mean, I would. Because if it was going to help the students in my classroom, you know, I wanted that. Because I'm not always 
got the best methods or the best whatever, I can use something from somebody else. The same way with other churches. We should be able to use something from other churches as long as it is godly. And that's where it's got, you've got to be careful of that. Then he says in verse 15, interesting, remember last week I asked you who killed Jesus? He says, even as they have of the Jews who both kill the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Who killed Jesus? <coughs> we all did. Paul says the Jews did. But ultimately it comes down, Romans were involved, and then he died for my sins. He died for my sins. But you see, Paul is not just looking at his ministry and what the Jews have done with him. He looked to hundreds of years in the past. And what did the Jews do with the true prophets? Don't you think, Paul, I mean, that uh, symbolically, we're in the process right now of killing Jesus. Explain that. Take, well, we're taking part in it. When we disregard His Word. When we disregard His Word and will not follow His Word. And this is an election year, so I'm going to say this. It's almost like some people have put politics over Christ. You know, I'll believe my political stance before I will believe what Jesus said. And people, that's wrong, 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 wrong. I don't care what political party you are. You need to put Christ first in everything and then it filters down from there. So he says, even in the past, the Jews killed the prophets. Paul has been stoned and they thought he was dead. He's been run out of every town and who ran him out? The Jews and there were some Gentiles that got involved. I was reading Micah several weeks ago and I came across this quote and I really like it. The reason false prophets are so popular is because of the true prophets unpopular message. And I read that and I thought, wow. Because the people back in the Old Testament, whenever, uh, you know, they came and surrounded Jerusalem and everything, one of the first things the kings did was call the prophets. Let's see if God's going to get us out of this. And the false prophets would come in and say, we're good. God would never, never let this happen to His people. And then the true prophets would come in and say, we need to repent. If we don't repent, bad things are going to happen. Well, who do the people want to believe? If we were being invaded by another country, we won't to hear what we want to hear. Let me ask you this. Why is the true prophet's message unpopular? We have to change our ways. Oh, very good. We have to change our ways. It requires repentance. And I ain't done nothing wrong. If Joe had made me do it, I wouldn't have done it. And, I, it, and that... It requires true repentance, not blaming anybody else. Anybody else? Do we have leaders today preaching a popular message? In what ways are they preaching a popular message? What people want to hear. Okay. And what people want to hear, we need to dig a little bit deeper than that. Well, one is the prosperity gospel. It's one of prosperity gospel. I was flipping through the channels this morning, and there was a guy on there saying, 
man, you need to sow this thousand dollar seed or God won't bless you. You know, and it's almost like, you know, well, never mind. I don't need to get off on that, but you're right. Anything else? What, what else? What is it we want to hear? What benefits ourselves? Okay, what benefits me? What sins are all right to commit? What my sins are okay to commit. <laughs> yeah. You know, as long as you tell me I'm good to go with my lifestyle, I'll come and I'll give money. Anybody else? We want to hear that we're good. That we're okay. That as long as we come and we come to Sunday school and worship service and we give, we're going to heaven. You know, we've had in the past, this summer, I'll say, several famous people die. And every time somebody famous dies, people assume what? They're in heaven. There was a famous guitarist that, that died, what, within the last week or so, Van Halen? Is that it? You know, uh, and I've seen the thing that he's in heaven playing his guitar. And I'm not saying he's not. But that's kind of one of the things that we want to hear is whenever people die, they're going to go to heaven. And as long as I hear that, then I'm okay. And I don't have to do anything. Becky, was you going to say something? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Paul right here is saying... You know, we came and we taught the Word of God, but yet we had people that were against us. They did not want us interfering with their ministry. So they ran him out of town. And we get more into that uh, a little bit next week. Because he says they even forbid us to talk to the Gentiles. It is one of these things that... Uh, some of the Jews thought, well, we're God's people, and you Gentiles are just, <laughs> you're just out of luck. I don't know what y'all, I guess y'all going to hell. You know, we're Jews, so we're, we're in. And if you teach anything different, and if you include anybody else, you're wrong. You're wrong. And he's saying, you know, the Jews have caused suffering for the cause of Christ for hundreds of years. For hundreds of years. So the question is today, are we doing the same thing? Are we hurting the cause of Christ? God forbid. Yeah, isn't that the truth? God forbid. When somebody tells you to go, like, like if, you, if, if you're going to change churches or whatever, and or you move to another city or whatever, and somebody might tell you, make sure you join a Bible-believing church. Have you ever heard somebody yes. say that? What is a Bible-believing church? Scripture and doesn't add or anything. Okay, somebody that, or, or one that preaches the scripture and doesn't add anything. Believe in the inerrancy of the word. Believe in the inerrancy of the word. Preaches the gospel. Yeah, it gives the gospel message on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. What should. Any lesson, any sermon, anything like that point to? Jesus. Jesus. It should point to Jesus always. Not the person delivering it, 
not the congregation, it should point to Jesus because he talks in earlier verses about the Word of God. And power in the Word, which is a whole different lesson. But whenever you say about a Bible-believing church, they need to believe the Bible. And I believe it needs to start with, with who Jesus is. What do you believe about Jesus? And I think it, with me, it starts with virgin born. If he is not virgin born, he's just like us. And if he's just like us, he couldn't save us. Amen. That, to me, is where it's got to start. Because if he was born of man and woman, then he was born into what? Sin. sin. If he was born into sin, he can't be God. I think it's got to start there. So, you've got all this, and then in verse 18, he says, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. Is Satan real? Yes. He is not a figment of somebody's imagination that they put in the Bible to give God an adversary. Satan is real. He's in the world today. He is at work, but he is limited. He's limited by what? By what God allows him to do. And that just fury infuriates him. <laughs> just infuriates him. Now I want you to go just a couple of uh, books back. Go to 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's on page 1261. If you're looking. Go to chapter 11. <clears throat> Go to verse 14. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And if you look back, he's talking about false prophets, false, prophets, false workers, things like that. <clears throat> and I got to thinking about this this week. And we know Satan is real, and we're talking about leadership, and we're talking about Satan being an angel of light. Okay, now I want you to think about this, because I don't have a really good answer. Whenever Satan transforms himself and his ministers into an angel of light, what do they look like? He makes them look good. I, and that first thing I thought of, but we got to go a little bit deeper. Yeah, but I agree with that. What you say? He makes things look good. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Just like he did Adam and Eve. You know. Let me ask this: Is sin fun? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. If anybody shakes their head like this, you you know something wrong with. You. <laughs> sin's fun and that's one of the things that Satan does is he makes us think sin is fun and it's okay but whenever he transforms himself into an angel of light what does he look like? like me and you like me and you false religion do what? false religion false religion I had, a, I had a difficult time with this whenever I was thinking about that this week. How do we tell the difference between Satan as an angel of light and the true gospel? You have to look through the eyes of Christ. And you have to look into God's Word. 
You have to look at the situation through what God says. And it comes to one, well, several things, but do you believe this book is God's word, word to mankind? Do you believe it is true? Do you believe it comes from God? Every word. then how can you tell if somebody is an angel of light or not? Counterfeit. They are counterfeit. And there can be, I've got a book at the house called Counterfeit Revivals. Kind of an interesting book. Satan has a bunch of people blinded. That religion is his number one tool. Um, and to give you a quote, it's when somebody dies and goes to heaven, they say, why should we let you go in? They said, we've done miracles in your name. And so God Matthew. says, depart from me, I never do you. So in religion, not relationship with Jesus. And that is, whenever we get to Matthew, whenever that's going to be, that's one of the things, yeah, that's in Matthew. That is so true. Because there are going to be people stand before Jesus and say, we cast out demons. We performed miracles. We did good works. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew. So how can you tell the difference? Pray for discernment. Number one is pray for discernment. And, and the Bible teaches that. Else? How, how can you tell? Well, the Holy, Robert, the Holy Spirit gives you a feeling when you're discussing something with somebody if their spirit is in sync with your spirit. You, you will know when you walk away from there. Well, you put it better than I did. If, if your spirit agrees with their spirit, I was thinking if your spirit jives with their spirit, you know. <laughs> You know, if there's a connection there. But you're exactly right. Have you ever listened to somebody on TV or in person and they were speaking and what they said sounded good, but there was something in your spirit that just said, no, no. I think that's where we've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. An angel of light is going to make you feel bad about what you believe. Does that make sense? That's happening today. That's happening today. They will make you feel bad about what you believe. Well, you're just, you're a bigot. You're this, you're that. You have no love in your heart. You are, and then you fill in the blank. And we got to stop. Because it's time to go to worship. <laughs>